For my second Brexit interview, I'm delighted to speak to Sir John Major. Sir John was British Prime Minister between 1990 and 1997 and spent a good portion of that time managing internal Conservative Party divisions over Europe. He's now campaigning for Britain to remain in the EU. Sir John, thank you for speaking to the My FT. Pleasure. The Remain camp began with a sense of confidence and wind in their sails. But in the last week or so, even ignoring the fact we can't trust the polls, there is a sense that the Leave campaign has the momentum. Uh, what has gone wrong? I think you're seeing a battle between economics and emotion. The economic case for remaining in Europe, I think, is almost one beyond any doubt at all. There is not a single international authority that has anything kind to say about Britain's future if we leave the European Union. So the case has been predominantly won. And I think that is understood by the Leave camp, who are turning to emotion. Emotion about sovereignty, emotion about security, emotion above all about immigration. And of course, that's a much easier case to put across, to fight for the status quo, to fight for the future uh, international prestige of the United Kingdom is a much more difficult case to put across than the simple mantras of we want our country back. But and I think, that is, I, th I think that is what has, uh, has bitten so deeply on behalf of the uh, Leave camp over recent days. Well, the economic case, as you say, uh, has been very forcefully put. All the international institutions, the IMF, <clears throat> the OECD, uh, the UK Treasury, but I wonder whether perhaps the Remain campaign has overegged it. They've been too precise about the exact shock There's and that people aren't moved or persuaded. There is a genuine difficulty there, and I take the point about overegging it. But I think there, there is a real difficulty there. When you have a whole series of reports from dispassionate bodies, whether it's the IFS or the Bank of England or the OECD or the World Bank, it's necessary to let people know what those reports say. And then when you, you uh, set out what those reports say, you face the charge that you're scaremongering. Now, of course, there is an alternative to that. Suppose nobody told the public what the implications would be, and then the implications came about. I think they would legitimately turn around to the politicians and say, why didn't you tell us what the effect of leaving Europe would actually be? And of course, that is the problem for the Remain camp. When they do that, they just find this, they just face this barrage of people saying scare stories, not true, people were wrong in the past, or in the case of some former politicians, that they're too old, what do they know about it? And so it gets brushed aside when it actually is absolutely fundamental to the future well-being of the people in this country. So what do you say to Michael Gove, who declares the people are tired of listening to the experts? Well, there's a degree of truth that they're tired of listening to the experts, but the experts are actually pointing out what will happen to their living standards. Let us suppose, for example, that we leave and we move to a World Trade Organization deal uh, subsequently with the Europe. That's probably going to put up the cost of the cars made in Sunderland, in Birmingham, in Wales, by about 10%. We will therefore sell less so there will be fewer car workers employed. That is the reality. And those are the points that we need to get across to people. And of course, when you do that, it sounds negative. But there are many other very positive reasons why we should stay in the European Union. And these positive reasons have largely, they've been presented, but they have largely been ignored during this campaign. We'll come to that in a minute, but do you think it, there was a, it was a mistake for the Remain campaign to essentially not speak about immigration? Well, I have spoken about immigration from the very outset. Now, I'm not a formal part of the Remain campaign, but I have a voice and I have used it. And I've spoken about immigration at length in every intervention that I have made. And what have you said? Uh, well, I have said several things. Firstly, I've pointed out that when you're talking of immigration, over half of it comes from outside Europe. And of that that comes from within Europe, 52,000 of the immigrants who are here are doctors and nurses. 43,000 are academics teaching in higher education. Um, another 80,000 are working in care homes helping, for the el helping the elderly. And a total of a quarter of a million are working in our public services. 
try and deal with our transport system without uh, Europeans, try and get a coffee in a hotel or a coffee house or anywhere else without being served by a European. They are integral to the way we actually live. And the belief that the immigration from Europe is bringing in lots of people, as the Leave campaign say, who are going to, to be undesirables in one sort or another, is simply not true. Now, several months ago, David Cameron said he was going to campaign on a substantial deal which he extracted or negotiated with his European partners. And there were some, including the Financial Times, who said this will not be a substantial deal because actually John Major got the substantial deal back in 1990-91 at the Maastricht Treaty with an opt-out on the euro, mm. an opt-out of the social chapter and an opt-out on Schengen. Mm. Was Mr Cameron mistaken in trumpeting that deal? Uh, I think you could, we can argue semantically about substantial. I think before... Well, you got a substantial deal. It's kind of you to say so. Thank you very much. I'm very glad I did. And I think it looks better now than perhaps it did then. Um, but consider before he went, there were people setting out hurdles which they knew and he knew and everyone knew could not possibly be achieved in negotiation. And the purpose of doing that was to say the moment he came back that it was an insubstantial negotiation and it had failed. So stopping now, freedom of movement, for example. Or at least wel welfare benefits well, immediately for him. EU yes, visits. well, that, that was a partial assistance. But I think he did get uh, an exemption from ever closer union, which before he went there, he was told by all the uh, Leave campaigners he could not get. And after he got it, was told by the Leave campaigners that it was meaningless. It go back to what you were saying about the political consequences, the implications of, of, a, of a Leave vote. I mean, many people believe that this really would diminish Britain and marginalise Britain. Well, I don't have a shred of doubt about that. And I would say that for several reasons. There are some very practical illustrations. Largely at British instigation, after Russia started misbehaving in Ukraine and casting its eyes upon Estonia and Georgia, led by the British, the European Union imposed pretty stringent sanctions on the Russians and kept them in check. And second recent illustration, perhaps, although uh, Mr. Kerry led a splendid negotiation with uh, Iran, he had tremendous help from the European Union and Baroness uh, Ashton as their foreign affairs spokesman in imposing sanctions on Iran and reaching an agreement that has inhibited Iran from developing a nuclear weapon for at least 10 years. Now, one has to ask oneself this question, could Britain have done that alone? And the answer to that is emphatically not. If we had imposed sanctions on Russia, Putin would have laughed. Consider Europe's position if the UK leave. What would they have lost? They'll have lost their best performing economy. They'll have lost one of only two countries with a nuclear capability and a big military capacity. And they will have lost a country with the longest, deepest and widest foreign policy reach. And they will have lost 65 million people. Now, in a world where you have an economic troika of, of America, China and Europe, Europe will diminish. Europe will have a lesser voice. The cradle of modern civilization will have a lesser voice than it has at the present time. And that is damaging for all Europe. Suppose Mr. Trump is elected. Do we... Is that really likely? I don't know. I didn't think he was going to be the candidate. <laughs> but he is the candidate. So I don't think one can entirely rule it out. Uh, but do we really want the world to be left for President Xi and perhaps President Trump or even America and China to dance around with without a significant European influence? I don't. And so Britain, by leaving, can help bring that about. Are we looking at Great Britain turning into Little England? Well, I think we will be diminished. I think we will be diminished. I think the Little England point can be followed up by what happens to the United Kingdom if we leave. And there are two aspects. Firstly, there's Scotland, and secondly, there's Northern Ireland. In terms of Scotland, it is overwhelmingly likely, not perhaps immediately, but at a suitable time when they think they can win, that the Scottish National Party would hold a second referendum on independence. They might win it. I don't know whether they would, but if we were out of Europe, and they wish to go back into the uh, European Union, they have a higher chance of winning than they do. Britain would lose Scotland. We would be left with a rump of England 
a very likely highly discontented Wales, and Northern Ireland. And then there is the Irish problem. If we leave the European Union, the border of the European Union then becomes between Northern Ireland and the Republic. The common travel area will end with very serious results for Ireland. But we would also have customs posts and border guards between Northern Ireland and the South. These are the big geopolitical questions, Sir John. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a more parochial question. What will happen to the Conservative Party? <laughs> is it going to split finally over Europe? Because you spent years managing divisions in the party. You even had a rather choice epithet for some of your colleagues in the cabinet, which we won't repeat on camera. <laughs> oh, but perhaps best not. Um, what will happen to the Tory party? Well, let me firstly say, I don't know uh, what, what will happen after the result. And it may depend on what the result is and how clear cut the result is. Both of those are very material to the position of all the political parties, including the Conservative Party, after the uh, result of the uh, referendum. But David Cameron does go if... I, I'm not leave. going to speculate on that. I very much hope that David Cameron remains as Prime Minister. I hope that we win. I hope he remains as Prime Minister. And I really don't think it would be helpful for me to speculate on what might happen thereafter. I'm focused at the moment on making sure we stay inside the European Union. That is the big prize. What happens internally is, of course, very important, but it is of a lesser importance than the long-term future of Britain inside the European Union. If we leave, we are out. Let us not fool ourselves in thinking we can be out for a couple of years, then reapply to go back and enjoy the same position we have now. It's over. It's irrevocable. It's over. It's irrevocable. And frankly, we are too proud and independent a nation to go crawling back to Europe in four or five or six years' time saying, we made a mistake, can we come back, please? I don't think you would ever get a majority for that inside the House of Commons or inside the country, simply because of our proud pride in nation. Sir John Major, thank you very much for joining the Financial Times. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.